got you! Hello, my lunatics. I'm Moonspirit. As a 90s kid, I have watched a lot of cartoons back in the day on many cartoon blocks. Disney Afternoon, Kids WB, Fox Box, and of course, Toonami. But I get more excited when I see video games getting their own TV shows. You know, like the usual suspects, the Super Mario Brothers Super Show, and the various Sonic cartoons. But today, I want to talk about a lesser known video game cartoon. The Earthworm Jim TV Show. Now for those who don't know the series, Earthworm Jim was a 90s game mascot that's synonymous for its wacky humor, art style, and of course, eclectic characters. The game series did so well, it eventually led to its own toy lines in the very cartoon show I'm about to review. I'm so excited to rewatch it and discuss this cartoon because, on top of being based on a fun series, it has a top tier voice cast. Seriously, we have Dan Castellaneta who voices Homer Simpson, Jeff Bennett who did Johnny Bravo, Jim Cummings who's the voice of many Disney characters, Andrea Martin from Kim Possible and Jimmy Neutron, and Katsushi from Rugrats' Phil and Lil. Just to name a few. Either way, it's time for me to go back into the 90s and watch some good old cartoons. As a 31 year old man. Shut up! Here's Earthworm Jim the TV Show! The episode begins with Earthworm Jim and Peter Puppy fighting against Professor Monkey for a Head on a planet full of very high platforms. Earthworm Jim! Prepare to be flame broiled! Jim fends off the professor with his detachable arm, but accidentally steps on Peter's foot, which causes Peter to mutate and Shiz goes south. Hey, Stoggy. Hmm, things aren't going well for Jim, so I guess. Time out! I'd really appreciate it if we could cut to the title sequence now. Oh, alright, let's shout. I have to say that the title theme is perfectly catchy. It reminds me of Steven Spielberg's cartoons, just as it easily gives the origin of Earthworm Jim. Jim was just a dirt eating, chewy link of worm flesh, but all that came to a crashing <laughs> game. I also like how it takes a tiny break, like, whoa, uh, let's take a little break here. Strong opening indeed. Now we need Jim's catchphrase. There we go. But let me make that authentic. Go Ruby! Go Ruby! Go Go Ruby! Go 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 Ruby! Okay, I'm done. The episode truly starts with Peter begging Jim to forgive him for his transformation. Peter transforms whenever he gets scared, hurt, or is under any high stress tension. I understand. You're saying I'm a worthless lump of gunk. Aw, oh, come on, Jim. Cut him some slack. How could you say no to those puppy eyes? Right then. So long as you understand. Oh, never mind. We caught the psycho who was summoned by, and the show quotes, The despicable queen pulsating, bloated, festering, sweaty, pus-filled, malformed slug for a butt. Right. So the queen slug hires Psycho to kidnap her sister, Princess What's-Her-Name. Like I said in the beginning, eclectic characters. Let me applaud your healthy lack of respect for family values here. Jim retrieves the ransom note pretending the princess is kidnapping, demanding Jim to hand over his super suit in exchange for the princess. All the while, Peter tries to get on his good side again. You can quit trying to suck up to me, it won't work. Jim deduces where the princess may be and leaves, leaving Peter with a heaping pile of garbage. The way I feel right now, even garbage has lost its subtle charm. Before going on his rescue mission, Jim goes shopping for a new sidekick at the Hero Hutch. And boy, they got some weird ones. <sighs> Meanwhile, back to Psycho, he gloats at the princess. He could never let his helpless gal pal suffer. Helpless? I have the strength of a hundred men! Oh! Damsel in Distress is not so in distress. So we cut back to Jim with his new psychic, the Shadow. I'm not the Shadow, I'm just a Shadow. Well, he does have a unique talent. Shadow Puppetry. Deet! Too bad old costume. Yeah. <sighs> Hope I can get my deposit back on him. Eh, Jim would be fine, I'm sure of it. 
so much for that. Oh, one more thing. The show also cuts to these interludes featuring the show's villains that don't pertain to the plot, as it's there as a comedic break for the show. I encourage you to go see them when you can. We cut back to Peter in depression. How depressed is he? Well, instead of words, he uses... Dance! Eh, 7.8 out of 10. Needs more. I wanna be Jim Sidekick again! I wanna be Jim Sidekick again! <laughs> beautiful, Peter. That was beautiful. <gasps> that gives me an idea. Stay tuned to the end to find out. Jim breaks free from his stomach imprisonment and finally reaches the princess. How I've longed to... Whoa! My hero! Oops, sorry Jim, but the princess is in another castle. Oh no. Jim returns back to his base and consults the idiot's guide to hideously dangerous places to search for the correct princess, each with different psychics and sometimes wrong princesses. Thankfully, the show has some good real-life referential humor, and this is just a speck of it. The Cavern of Flesh-Ripping Weasels? No. Detroit? No. Psycho, meanwhile, tries to fend off Princess What's-Her-Name, only to get dunked. Literally. Unfortunately for the princess, she dunked him into his ex crow skeleton, which finally gives Psycho the upper hand. You know, I usually avoid saying this, but... Uh... As that happens, we cut to Peter making a huge decision. This one definitely tastes more like butter. Not that decision! Oh, right. Sorry. Jim finally deduces where the princess really is, thanks to his uncanny warm senses. You know, it's like Spidey Sense, only except wormy and not that useful. While Jim packs to leave, Peter stashes himself in for a ride, as they head to the Boulevard of Acute Discomfort. Jim and his new psychic turns his eyelids inside out, boy. Investigate the Evil Tower. Hotel. Jim interrogates the hotel receptionist by doing a full throttle nose technique that would make Ben proud. And finally reaches Psycho. Unfortunately, Jim gets squashed and the sidekick gives support. Which goes as well as you think. Oh, a good thing the sidekick's union has a comprehensive medical plan. Luckily, Jim has another plan. And another catchphrase. Eat dirt! <laughs> that did it! If you've dinged it, I'm gonna be frightfully baked! Or not. Jim has a plan B. Doing his impression of scared shitless Homer Simpson. <laughs> Jim then gets cornered and Psycho's about to unleash the final blow. Until Peter shows up and threatens Psycho to stop or he'll get angry. Which he does. This can't be good. Thanks to Peter, Jim catches Psycho and saves Princess What's Her Name. Or not. Thought you'd never beat that stupid bird. Wanna go for a pizza? <laughs> this episode ends with Jim proclaiming his victory with his now and forever psychic, Peter Puppy, to the princess. Rest assured, with Earthworm Jim as your protector, nothing in the universe shall ever harm you! With the possible exception of a cow. Oh, by the way, the prologues here on now don't pertain to the plot, just like the interludes that precede them, so I'm just going to skip them and tell you guys to check it out yourself. Episode 2 begins at the infernal planet of Heck, home of Evil the Cat. There, he brews a concoction made up of various evil things, including a, you may have already won, letter, to conjure a spell to uncover the location of the book. Not the book! Yes! The book! What is the book? The Necronomicon of Book of the Dead? No, it is Fuzzy Wuzzy's Funny Animals Pop Up. Huh? Apparently, this one book contains a grave misprint of Ye Mystic Secret of Ultimate Destruction! But take a wild guess where that book is. 
<laughs> I just never get enough of the punchy wudgy hippo. <laughs> just as Jim discovers the grievous misprint, Evil the Cat gives Jim a house call, and Evil demands the book. Jim relents, so Evil sinks his hench rats with cheesy weapons. And I do mean cheesy. Mushy French cheese! Hmm, that is some bad cheese. Jim then gets encased in cheddar cheese, but Peter brings him to safety. Must cut the cheese! Jim has Peter to call for help from his fellow canines to chase evil away. Foolish dogs. I could destroy you with a thought. Dogs rule and cats rule! Woo! However, Evil the Cat has a plan B. But will it work? Boo hoo and woe is me. I am so bored and wish I had some amusing book with which to entertain myself with. Let me guess, Jim falls for it. <laughs> and he does. My mind reels back to my own sad childhood. The horrible dank burrows. Uh, probably too well? And the curse house! The terrible dragon cross! <laughs> Jim, just give him the book before your PTSD kicks in! Oh, right. Sorry. And cue the DON'T the moment. The <laughs> By the great worm spirit, whose mighty bristles strike the hammer blows of justice! After him! Oh yeah, I forgot to mention. He makes plenty of statements like that, obviously parodying superheroic statements, which adds a bit of charm to the show. My uncanny worm senses detect the dread footfalls of villainy! By the great worm spirit whose segments span the labyrinths of eternity! Oh wait, where was I? Oh yeah, the chase! Jim is in pursuit of Evil the Cat and attacks! We must have more speed! I cannot do it, Captain! She'll not take the strain! Why are you talking like that? Hey, it was the 90s. Everyone was doing it. Evil the Cat retaliates with torpedoes which causes Jim's ship to fall into the most horrible peril in the entire universe! A gym teacher? Okay, second most horrible peril. A black hole! Oh, hi, Cosmic Drain Plug. As Jim and Peter fall to their impending doom, Peter repairs the ship while Jim tries to use his four hyper-intelligent brains, which comes up with... I'm hungry! I'm cold! I'm itchy! Where are the girls? Nothing. So, Jin does the next best thing. Shooting at the black hole! Take dirt, insufferable space anomaly! Which is apparently working as it's helping repel the ship away from the black hole. Because science talk Jim doesn't understand from Peter. Huh? 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 Girls? While the ship is being repaired, Evo reads, Ye mystic secret of ultimate destruction. And according to that page, Evil needs to shatter the universe by causing the reeking beasts in the Mal Oderon system to shriek the right frequency. And to do that, they need to see a Fungu Fork. Of course. As Evil heads to the home of the reeking beasts, Jim tries to recall what was on that page. Come on, brains, do your stuff! That is so me whenever I try to write scripts. But Peter knows a way to jog the most stubborn of memories. The hideous stench of... The Reeking Beasts! Well, ain't that a cool winky dink? Evil creates his holographic device while Jim exposes himself to the odious odor of the Reeking Beasts. Much to the suffering of Peter Puppy. Jim finally remembers, but unfortunately, the smell becomes so unbearable for Peter, he transforms and attacks Jim. Luckily for Jim, he manages to intercept evil. Oh no! Oh my god! It's the end of the universe! We are all going to die! Or at least it should have been. The end of everything sure is saying it's time. Why isn't everything shattering? What went wrong? I'll tell you who's to blame. The one percent. 
No, wait, no, stop, no, wait. Not that 1%. That 1%. Oh, sad. Oh, looks like a cantaloupe, don't it? <laughs> Should have read the fine print. After Jim reverts Peter back, Evo tries to convince the blind beast to shriek to no avail, which gives Jim enough time to remove the clothespins off of Evo and his hench rat and destroy the holographic device. The universe is saved and Jim and Peter strands Evo the cat on the Mal Odoron system. Episode 3 begins in Turlock, where Earthworm Jim resides and is getting the morning paper by playing catch with his house, complete with his own inner monologue. It was up to me now. After the hours of sweat and practice, the weeks of training, the long nights at the diner tossing waffles. Remember this part, it plays a pivotal moment later in this episode. Unfortunately, his celebration is cut short twofold. Firstly, he suddenly feels drained, and secondly, the sudden arrival of Queen Slug for a butt. Jim tries to fend off the Queen's Zerb warriors, but it's no use since his suit is leaving him beat. So he and Peter retreat to the one place they suspect no one will look for them, the International House of Haggis. Look up what Haggis is and you'll know why. Jim consults the suit's manual and surmises that he must explore, and Jim quotes, Journey to the center of the suit. I don't know, Snat. Who's Jules Verne? You're referencing my book, you squirmy oaf. And as Jim explores the insides of his suit, he realizes the battery is low. Unfortunately for our heroes, the Zerp warriors infiltrate the IHOH, stressing out Peter to the point he alters into his mutated safe, accidentally giving him and Jim's location. Boy, our heroes are in trouble. What can be done? <laughs> Foolish villains! Cower before evil's mysterious foe, Johnny Dactyl! Wait, Johnny Dactyl? Johnny Dactyl, you are Wait, hold on. Hello, uh, Perry? Yo, Moon Spirit, what's up? Hey, Perry, listen, uh, I got a quick question to ask. Oh, yeah? Go ahead. Right, uh, do you happen to know a Johnny Dactyl? Nani to heck? I'm the only Dactyl I know. Well, I'm witnessing Earthworm Jim being rescued by a pterodactyl-themed superhero named Johnny Dactyl. Do you happen to know him by chance? Oh, yeah. Johnny Dactyl. That name does ring a bell. I think we go way back. No way. Uh, let me ask you this. Was he badass back in the day? What? Nah, dude. He's no badass. What? You sure? Because these bug warriors just fled in terror by Johnny's presence and his awesome voice. <laughs> No, 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 no. You got it all wrong, man. Johnny is a wussy boy. He's just hiding the wussiness underneath that disguise. No way. Just listen to him. Tell me he's not badass. Like the fall of night I come, and silent as a cloud. See? He's so cool, and... I was a stupid CD player. I was almost done with my mysterious speech. It's all ruined. <laughs> Oh, he's just a doofus underneath that suit. I know my dactyls, dude. Freaking told you. Okay, um, never mind, Barry. Uh, well, thanks for the clarification. Anytime, my dude. I love working with you. So after Johnny Dactyl's appearance, Jim and Peter retreat to his secret hideout and parlays with the warm future to find answers. Yuck! What do you mean invalid parameters? 9,000 gigs of RAM and it can't answer a simple question. Just one more gig and I could have made an overnight thousand joke! But then again, this joke is as old as this TV show, some would say. Peter takes a gander at Jim's ass. Only because the battery slide is located there because why not? It makes a discovery that Jim's suits run on the battery of the gods! Jim deducts they must get a new battery at the long sought home of the gods! How does one find such a mythical location? Simple! Jim consults the phone book of the gods! See kids? Those are called phone books! That's what we use to look for locations! No Google Maps here, just good old yellow pages! Dear God! 
I feel like a fossil just saying this. Jim and company arrive at the home of the gods, but unfortunately for them, they are stopped by the doorman of the gods. How could they get in? A sacrifice? A tribute? A... Wow! A whole dollar! Oh, be my guest! <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's hilarious. So they get in, but are confronted by a few gods and are about to be smite. Much to their dismay. Man! The gods stink! Before they could be smitten, the guys convince the gods not to because gods like them love to meddle in mortal affairs. But the gods admit that they are really gods in training since the real gods are in Valhalla and they weren't invited. Here's some quick intros to them. Japius, god of puns. Persephacor, goddess of disco with a walk god in head. And Flamifus, god of nasal discharge, who is happy to give Snot a nasal flute. Don't ask why, it's important in the episode later. I think I know why these guys never get invited to parties. Jim asks these gods in training for a battery of the gods, but they decide to give Jim to answer a riddle. What is the sound of one hand clapping? How does Jim answer? Well, we can't argue with that. Note to self, slapping someone in the face equals one hand clapping. So Jim's suit is recharged thanks to a battery of the gods from Disco Goddess's Walk God. Nah, don't worry, sweetheart. Wait another decade or so, you'll replace that with a Nye God. Recharged and ready to go, Jim is now able to confront Queen Slug for a bot to save his town. The Queen releases her soldiers, but Jim fends them all off with the Nasal Flute. See? That thing does play a paramount role. That sounds worse than Hoka must be. The Queen isn't pleased with her minions' retreat and decides to fight Jim herself to which Jim happily accepts the challenge and proceeds to fire his blaster at her. Unfortunately, she's able to repel all those energy blasts with her scepter and fights back with her own blast, and they pack a wallop. Hey! That could've hurt! Jim evades throughout until he decides to play baseball for the next upcoming blast with the same inner monologue from the opening. This, the weeks of training, the centuries of war, plague and famine, it all came down to this one pitch. I told you guys to remember that in the first place. With that, Jin defeats Queen Slug for a bot and sends her flying into outer space. Jim and company celebrates their victory, albeit with the town mostly in ruins. And Jim ends with the nasal flute. Everybody's a critic! That's true, because I'm going to be one right now. And I gotta say, this show's great! In fact, it warms my heart. Get it? Like Earthworm? Jim? Well, regardless of that awful pun, I'd still say this show holds up. The humor is great as it reminds me of Animaniacs and Simpsons with its satirical and parodic humor. I wouldn't say this show is better than those, but it's still worth giving a watch. And like I said, the voice cast is stellar with everyone giving their all, and it puts a smile on my face every time I hear them. I might revisit this series in the future because this deserves binge watching. Get this on Amazon because it's practically dirt cheap. The DVD is bare bones with nothing else to offer, but the series itself is worth watching. With all that said, that's all the time I have for you all today, so until then, I'm Moon Spirit. And I leave you with this, an interpreted dance of what goes in my head for 30 seconds, more or less. Mama had a chicken, Mama had a cow, Dad was proud, he didn't care how. Hello, Ebrinian. How are you? Why, thank you. Oh my god!